Good evening and welcome to the second public discussion and engagement on the subject of the Caribbean Court of Justice and whether we as a people in St. Lucia understand what the CCJ is, whether it is that we should embrace it as our final appellate court, and very importantly, whether we the people should have a say by way of a referendum as to whether it is St. Lucia should embrace the CCJ. I wish to thank the Education Committee for hosting this public lecture. Too very often, we expect citizens to participate meaningfully in discussions of this nature without necessarily being exposed to the various perspectives. The United Workers' Party embraces its responsibility to educate and therefore has sought to engage members of the public on this very important matter. Let me therefore welcome you for tuning in and to thank those of you who are here in person. Chairman of the United Workers Party, Andy Daniel. Deputy Chairpersons, Mrs. Fortuna Bellrose and Mr. Francis Denbo. Other members of the National Executive, Mrs. Pearl Quinn Williams, our guest speaker for this evening's forum. Members of the Education Committee responsible for hosting this public engagement, specially invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, friends, good evening. Last week, we met in Grosley, where we began our public lecture series on the topic of the CCJ. We were joined by legal luminaries such as Sir Byron, Justice Moise, Mr. Williams, Mr. Gordon, and I must say the reception that they received tells us that as a people, we understand how important it is for us to have a say and to be fully plugged into the democratic process well beyond casting a vote once every four or five years. Let me again thank those who joined us then and to thank you for joining us this evening for the second such public lecture. I now invite Kellyanne to offer prayers, after which Malaika will sing the national anthem, and I pray that we'll all join her in singing it then. Kellyanne? I'm advised it is Elizabeth. I do beg your pardon, Elizabeth. Eternal God and Father, we thank you for bringing us here this evening. Father, we give you thanks, we give you praise, we give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you adoration. We thank you for the day, Father God, and you have taken us thus far, Father God. Father God, I lift up this meeting to you tonight. I lift up the presenters, everyone that will be speaking tonight at this meeting everyone that is here tonight i pray that everything we will be listening to tonight we will be attentive so that we can listen and learn we will hear the negatives and the positives of the ccj because a lot of people is hearing about the ccj and they do not understand what the ccj is so my god tonight i lift up every teacher all the people in the teacher in the teaching group organization that is that put that 
CCJ meeting together so that people can come from all walks of life and listen. Father, those who are on their way, I ask you to hasten their footsteps. Father, I give you thanks. I give you praise. I ask you to bless everyone that is here tonight. And when we go back home, let us go back home safe. Give us journey mercies. This I ask in no other name but the name of your son, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen, amen, and amen. Good evening. Please remain standing and assume the posture for our national anthem. Sons and daughters of St. Lucia Love the land that gave us birth Land of beaches, hills and valleys Fairest isle of all the earth Wheresoever you may roam Love, oh love, our island home Gone the times when nations battle for this hell and of the west Gone the days when strife and discord Deemed her children's toil and rest Dawns at last a brighter day Stretches out a glad new way May the good Lord bless our island God her sons from woe and harm May our people live united Strong in soul and strong in arm Justice, truth, and charity Our ideal forever be Thank you, please sit. Thank you very much, Malaika, for this beautiful rendition of the National Anthem. And thank you, Elizabeth, for leading us in prayer. On the last occasion, one of the comments that was made was that it appeared that many of the panelists were pro-CCJ, at which time we were advised that Ms. Quinn Williams would be here today to offer the people's perspective. Mwavidia Timor Kweol, Pape, Siyankao Tonaye, Opa Jekopwan, Powerity Corp, parce que la carrière l'occasion pour ça m'a des questions. Et pas peur pour m'a des questions, parce que ça c'est où ils ont nous dit ces meetings là. Pour nous ça, encourager mon pour participer et pour m'a des ces questions, so that les yo je ne camarade en boutique, bon la place, cabaret, en l'église ou même quand il s'agit de l'opinion, parce qu'il faut prendre le CGA. Donc, merci un peu, je suis content de vous dire tout le monde. Et je voulais inviter M. Quinn Williams pour causer et pour écouter ça, nous connaissons des questions. M. Williams, over to you. Thank you very kindly. I do beg your pardon. While M. Williams is preparing herself, it is for me to call upon the chairman of the United Workers Party, Andy Daniel, to offer welcome remarks. That's me just wanting to get down to business. <laughs> Over to you, Andy. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Deputy political leader, Gail T.C. Rugbert, doctor. Deputy Chairperson, persons, or the members of the National Executive, Mrs. Pearl Queen Williams, our guest speaker, members of the Education Committee, specially invited guests. Let me 
give a special welcome to the members of Castro's Central Branch. I realize that our moderator is sticking and trying to ensure that time, we keep the time. So therefore, I will put away my script and try to be as short as I possibly can. I say welcome to the second session on the CCJ. I think it is critically important for us as a United Workers' Party to have these sessions. And not just on the CCJ. The CCJ is just the start. But we shall have discussions on the economic development of St. Lucia. We will have discussion on matters affecting women and children. We will have discussion on matters affecting people with disability. We will have discussion on matters affecting persons or what should I say, the minimum wage, critical. And I believe the time has come for this party to show that it is the preferred political party and understand what is affecting the people of St. Lucia. So when the idea of the education committee was conceptualized, it is thinking not just because we're in opposition, because in opposition, you prepare to be in governance. And that is the first step. And I will say to you, with these few words, I bid you welcome. And I ask you to listen attentively to the presenter. You will have the opportunity to question or make comments. And thereafter, we can have a wonderful discourse. Once come, one and all, brothers and sisters. I beg of you, therefore, to pay attention to Ms. Quinn as she shares with us some of her perspectives on the CCJ and what we as Sanusians should consider in contemplating the extent to which we as a people embrace the CCJ. Ms. Williams will join us via Zoom. Please, let's welcome her heartily. Hello. Hello. Hi. Good night. Is that for me? Okay, all right. So I, I thought you were um, speaking to someone else. So thank you for inviting me, Fortuna, to speak to you about my thoughts on the CCJ becoming the final appellate court. Some of you may have heard me speak at a town hall meeting in October 2018 in the run-up to the constitutional referendum in November to replace the Privy Council with the CCJ as our final appellate court here in Antigua and Barbuda. The main thrust of my argument then was the lack of trust in the judicial system at the lower courts level. And sadly, the distrust has deepened because there have been no serious efforts made to address our issues with trust. In fact, since then, there have been more incidents that have caused the deepening of distrust. Many of you would know that the referendum was defeated. 
with 47.96% of the voters voting yes and 52.04% voting no. In a very, very low turnout, voter turnout of 33.5%. Grenada also held a referendum, the same referendum on the same day, and they had an even lower voter turnout of 28%. And the referendum was defeated there as well. In 2009, a referendum was held in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and 56% of the voters voted no. In none of the countries was there even a simple majority in favor of the CCG, much less the two-thirds majority required for constitutional referendums. What was very noticeable listening to the commentary and presentations coming out of Grenada was that Grenada had the same issues and concerns we have in Antigua and Barbuda. In fact, presentations by lawyer Kenny Kentish and myself were circulated widely in Grenada to give another side of the argument. So it would be reasonable to conclude that in the region, from island to island, the issues of lack of trust, political interference, lack of distance from the political directorate, the corruption and inefficiencies we see and experience at the lower courts level are common. I know that there in St. Lucia, you do not need a referendum to move to the CCJ as the final appellate court. All it requires is a two-thirds parliamentary majority. But while it is not a legal requirement, I believe it is the moral thing to do to let the people decide. Give them the facts on both sides of the argument and let the people make an informed decision on the matter. I feel that a matter as serious as whether or not to make the CCJ the final appellate court in any jurisdiction should have the approval of the voters via a referendum and not just two-thirds majority in Parliament. And if it is that legally all that is required is a two-thirds parliamentary majority, then there ought to be balanced, widespread education, consultation, and sensitization meetings with the public. There should be town halls in, in all the communities giving them the information and getting the support and buy-in from the people and listening to their concerns so that when the bill is up for debate, there can be a robust debate on it with the parliamentary representatives really representing the will of their constituents. And it is not just a case of form and ceremony where the eyes have it. I don't think a few parliamentarians should, in essence, force this move on the people of any jurisdiction. Let the people decide. I understand from prominent Dominicans that in Dominica, which was the first and only OECS country to sign on to the CCJ in the appellate jurisdiction, and where no referendum was required, that there was very little to no consultation, education, sensitization, and engagement with the stakeholders and the public done on the move to the CCJ. I don't think this is the right way to go about making the switch. But that's just my humble opinion as a lay person. And you can give it as much or as little weight as you want. I find it quite curious, though, that Trinidad and Tobago, where the CCJ sits, has not moved to have the CCJ as the final appellate court. I remember reading an article that said that only a two-thirds legislative majority is needed. And while PNP had indicated that they were committed to ratifying the move to the CCJ in its appellate jurisdiction, it would need the support of the opposition UNC parliamentarians. And the leader of the opposition, Pamela Prasad Bissessa, has indicated that she would not support any such reform unless it has first been approved by a majority of the voters in a referendum. So there seems to be a stalemate there. 
Let me make it clear here. As I've said before, I am not fundamentally opposed to the CCJ. I believe in the competence of our judges and that in due course, it is the right and natural thing for us to move to the CCJ as our final appellate court. I believe it is a step in ridding ourselves of the vestiges of colonialism. But while I appreciate those arguments, to me, they're peripheral and cannot take precedence to integrity, which is the foundation of any judicial system. Because when it comes to justice, trust is still a must. And it has to start from the bottom up, not the top down. Any apex court, whether it is the Privy Council or the CCJ, is a part of the judicial system. And you cannot simply extricate it from the system. It's a four-part court system. You have the magistrate court or the industrial court. Then you have the high court. Then you have the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. Then you have the Privy Council or the CCJ. You have to go through these three law courts before you can take a matter to the Privy Council or the CCJ. These courts make up for the foundation and main structure of the judicial system. They make up for the greater part of the system. These are the courts that the masses use and have experience with. And their experiences shape their perception of the judicial system. And you know what they say? Perception is reality. Less than 1% of persons accessing the judicial system will use the Privy Council or the CCG. So to my mind, if governments are serious about moving to the CCJ as the final appellate court, they must address the issues the masses have with the lower courts so that the whole judicial system can be improved. As Dame Janice Pereira says, access to justice starts from the bottom up. It is very concerning to me that we have been talking about these issues ad nauseum and there have been very little effort made to address them. And it is indicative of the scant regard they have for the people they are to serve. Let's look at the issue with corruption and efforts to address it. Oh dear. Hello? and our efforts to address it. Somebody called in. Oh dear. Let's look at our issue with corruption and our efforts to address our issues with corruption. The examples I will cite are from Antigua, but they are relevant to you because magistrates, judges, and directors of public prosecution can be assigned to any country in the region. Take the matter of the chief magistrate, who in 2020, after she issued a bench warrant for member of parliament, Asad Michael, in a civil matter, she said he threatened her. He denied he threatened her and said to the media, and I quote here, all I did was send her a WhatsApp message that I would send a written complaint to the Chief Justice of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, seeking to have her removed from the bench for corruption and skullduggery, which I will substantiate with incontrovertible evidence. And that, Michael said, is not a threat. It is a promise to act in the interest of the integrity of our justice system. The magistrate recused herself from the case as requested by Michael's lawyer. What is troubling is that neither the executive arm of government nor the Bar Association did anything to investigate the veracity of the allegations. Instead, the Bar Association put out a statement condemning the statement by MP Michael. You can make your judgment as to whether or not you think that response was a good effort to address issues of alleged corruption or the perception of corruption within the judiciary. Because when it 
comes to the judicial system, justice must not all only be done. It must be seen to be done. Take the case of the director of public prosecution, Anthony Armstrong, who earlier this year was found guilty of professional misconduct by Jamaica's General Legal Council. Now, hear this. He was sent on administrative leave while he appealed the judgment. And do you know who was put to act as DPP? The same magistrate MP Michael accused of corruption. The same magistrate that only last month an investigation was launched into for alleged misconduct. Nothing, notwithstanding, notwithstanding an injunction was granted to stop the investigation. Then one would think that they would wait until the DPP's appeal judgment is rendered, until, the, the, until he's exonerated, before he's put back into the position. But he was put back into the position and was performing his duties up until last week when a red alert was issued for him by Interpol and he was arrested and charged with several counts of fraud on his return to his homeland, Jamaica. How does one have confidence in the judicial system when you had a DPP prosecuting persons with this dark cloud on his own integrity? But that's not all. This is the same DPP that the Prime Minister accused of being corruptly paid by MP Asad Michael. He wrote, it's not beyond me, Asad, to get the law enforcement to reopen the IHI case and to remove the DPP who you corruptly paid to protect you in the past. The DPP responded that he considers the Prime Minister's allegation to be an attack on his integrity and that of law enforcement, as it gives the impression that law enforcement can be directed to do the bidding of the executive. I can tell you, that has always been the impression. It has always been the impression of the masses here in Antigua. And it was simply confirmed by the Prime Minister. Perception, perception is everything. Again, no investigation was conducted by the Attorney General or the Bar Association, except for putting out another statement condemning the Prime Minister's statement. No effort made to investigate the validity of the allegation of corruption coming from the highest level of the executive, the Prime Minister himself. How can persons have confidence in the justice system when you have this sort of mess? These are the kinds of incidents that undermine confidence in the judicial system. In my previous presentation, I recommended that a disciplinary commission be set up, made up of persons from civic organizations, NGOs, religious organizations, good governance groups, and a retired judge, because it would appear that the Judicial and Legal Services Commission is reluctant to discipline their own. It is public knowledge that other complaints have been made against these two judicial officers to the JLSC, and they have resulted in no disciplinary action, with reasons given that they are unjustified. I cannot recall a single case in Antigua where a magistrate, DPP, judge, or an attorney was disbarred, suspended, or removed from the bench. Now, let me say here, I do not know what maintains in St. Lucia. Maybe there you have no issues with trust of the judicial system. Maybe there you have members of the legal fraternity being disciplined because of the fact that the JLSC is domiciled in St. Lucia. I don't know. Maybe that is so. But I know that here in Antigua, no one that I can recall has ever been disbarred or disciplined or removed from the bench. Until and unless we begin to see judges, magistrates, DPPs, lawyers being disbarred and removed from the benches and paying the consequences for corruption, we will continue to lack confidence in the judicial system. 
and it makes the move to the CCJ as the apex school more unlikely. I can hear some person say, but this is not happening at the CCJ. This is happening at the lower courts level. I agree that the tentacles of corruption may not have touched the CCJ as yet, but it is still relatively new. The shine is not yet off, and it will only be a matter of time before the clammy tentacles of corruption grasp it, and we will not be able to stop it then. Now is the time to take serious action to stamp out corruption in the lower courts so that the members of the legal fraternity do not feel that they can engage in corrupt acts with impunity. Our history is replete with examples of corrupt acts by members of the legal fraternity at the lower courts level. And some of these are the same judges, magistrates, that may eventually sit on the CCJ bench. It is said a good indicator of future behavior is past behavior. The confidence cannot be at the top, at the CCJ level only. It is not a standalone entity. We must have confidence in the lower courts that are a part of the judicial system. Those are the courts the masses use. We must go through those courts first. It starts from the bottom up, not the top down. Then, when we look at the administrative nightmare that exists in the lower courts, the backlog of cases, persons waiting on remand for years for cases to be called, issues with the physical structure of court buildings that are in a state of disrepair or are inadequate in size. Here in Antigua, we are still waiting for the promised repairs to be carried out on the St. Charles Magistrates Court building so that the court can move out of the community center in Grace Farm. The governments of the OECS, or the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, millions of dollars. The Chief Justice of the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court, Dame Janice Pereira, said at the opening of the 2020 law year, and I quote here, speaking of financial capital, I once more call on the executives of our governments across the region to do more than provide lip service support to the court. The court has been made to operate for several months now without an approved budget and with promises made, not kept. She went on that the judiciary is pegged somewhere on the bottom rung of the ladder. The continued chronic failure to adequately fund the court prevents the court from putting strategic plans into action. One of the recommendations made in 2018 was for the government to clear their arrears to the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court and create an independent trust fund similar to what maintains for the CCJ to fund the court's recurrent expenses. I guess that was not taken on board because the cry for the court to be funded continues. Clearly, there has been very little effort to address the situation. When the lower courts are handicapped due to inadequate funding, it negatively impacts the entire judicial system and the people they serve. It has to be from the bottom up, not the top down. You cannot fund the top court and not the bottom courts. I have heard persons trying to discount the argument of the lack of distance of the CCJ from the political directory. But there is no dispute in this fact. All these judges, lawyers, magistrates, and politicians know each other and are in some cases related. The former Attorney General of St. Petersburg, Vincent Byron, was the brother of Sir Dennis Byron, the former president of the CCJ. The current president of the CCJ was once a politician and ran as a candidate in the same party with Ralph Gonzalez, the current prime minister of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And while I appreciate that these judges operate with a high level of integrity, professionalism, and competence, they are also humans. 
and there is a certain amount of psychological pressure that may make them unable to resist the temptation to rule in favor of their bias. People prefer the distant justice of the Privy Council. No familial or social ties to any person accessing the court. They know no one. They have no interest in seeing one party win over the other. So they will apply the law without fear or favor. And we will be able to say justice is truly blind. The reality is, when it comes to justice, most people don't really care whether the court is in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, or Timbuktu, or whether the judges are white or black or Asian or African, as long as they are competent. They just want blind justice. As it relates to cost, there can be no argument now about the cost being lower to go to the CCJ as opposed to going to the Privy Council. Because in this age of technology, you no longer have to travel to have the case heard because it can be done via video conference. In fact, that is the order of the day now, even for the CCJ and the Eastern Caribbean Supreme Court. The only cost would be your filing fees and lawyer fees. I remember at our town hall when the Honorable Justice Saunders was asked, what would be the cost to go to the CCJ? He said, Besides the U.S. $60 filing fee, it is as much as your lawyer charges. The same applies to the, for the Privy Council. The fact is, legal representation is more expensive the higher up you go in the court system. So the lowest legal fees would be at the magistrate or the industrial court level, with the highest fees being the CCJ or the Privy Council level. Perhaps the lawyers can be more magnanimous and reduce their costs to an affordable amount or do cases pro bono. Look, folks, I agree with all the noble arguments about our independence, cutting ties to our colonial masters, about pride and confidence in our old competent judges who know our cultural norms and idiosyncrasies about doing this for our children who may aspire to be a judge on the CCJ bench. But of what value is all this to you if you get a perverse judgment at the lower court's level or your case is delayed for an interminably long time or even dismissed because witnesses have died or due to corruption or inefficiency? What value is it to you if your case never gets there. My question is, what is causing the resistance, the reluctance or indifference by the powers that be to deal with the issues of corruption and inefficiencies at the lower courts? What, what is causing it? Why? Why would they not want to address the issue of distrust of the judicial system? so that the public can have confidence in the whole judicial system. Is it not more desirable? Why put a shiny new roof on an old broken down house? It makes no sense. Folks, I know that it is unrealistic to expect the elimination of all corrupt acts because we are all fallible humans. I know that. But the goal must be a judicial system that at all levels adheres to the highest level of independence, impartiality, integrity, transparency, and accountability. A judicial system that incorporates all these qualities minimizes opportunities for corruption, it exercises vigilance over corruption, and it responds decisively when corruption is detected. Had good faith efforts been made to address the issues highlighted in 2018, we likely would have been farther along in getting the support of the public in moving to the CCJ as our final appellate court. I once again call on the powers that be. It is time to stop the talking and do what is necessary to address the issues at the lower courts level so that we can have a judicial system 
that from the bottom to the top, we can be proud of and have confidence in. And, and don't tell us, let's move first to the CCJ and then we will deal with the issues at the lower courts after. We would never get these issues addressed if we do that. It must start from the bottom up. One of our famous local bands, Burning Flame, sang a song. And one line says this, if you get what you want tonight, will you remember me tomorrow? Folks, let's do the work from the bottom up and get this done for all of us now and for posterity. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Mrs. Pearl Quinn Williams. For those of you who were at last week's event, it is fair to say that you now have a full menu of the various perspectives and perhaps, perhaps you are better equipped to comb through these and determine for yourselves whither goes the people uh, with respect to the CCJ. I now open the floor for questions and comments. I imagine we have a roving microphone that will allow for amplification. Whither goes St. Lucia? Where do the people go from here? What are the questions, comments of concern? For those of you who were not at last week's session, we dealt with questions such as, is it necessary, is it affordable, is it efficient, is it effective? Are our judges adequately equipped to dispense justice with fairness? Are our judges as equally equipped as those of the Privy Council? Is it that we are to embrace the CCJ as perhaps the last indication of our full independence, autonomy, and sovereignty in uh, its most pregnant manifestation, I imagine? Are we confident that Embracing the CCJ will cure some of the challenges that we have in the lower courts. Are we confident that the issues of size, trust, familiarity, political interference, that these should not interfere with the effective, efficient, running of a CCJ, are we satisfied as a people uh, that judges who come from within oh, yeah. dispense? So these are the questions that we have been toying with. I imagine Ms. Williams wants to make an intervention. Over to you, Ms. Williams. I, I can't hear. Oh, is that what you were saying? I, I did not hear. I, I was... I thought that I can't out. I, I don't know what happened there. So, can you hear me now? Are yes, you? I'm hearing you now. But so, what we are doing at this juncture, Miss Williams, is to invite members of the audience to pose any questions that they may have or offer any comments on what they've heard thus far and at which point we shall invite you to respond accordingly. At this time, I do not see any hands. Yes, Ms. James? My question at the last meeting remains. I'm even more doubtful that we should go to the CCJ without a referendum of the people. Can't hear you. So what I will do, thank you, Ms. James. Unless we can address the distrust of the people with what's happening in the lower courts, 
I don't see that we can go to a referendum, to, to um, the CCJ, until we can sort the lower courts out. The distrust is there. It's not only St. Lucia. It's a regional problem that people have with not trusting the judiciary because of the cases that have fallen by the wayside. It's a question of who you know and who knows you. Otherwise, you don't stand a chance. Ms. Williams, if you are to allow me 10 seconds to indicate that we have a question from the audience that reflects concerns about trust and the extent to which the, the issue of trust can be adequately addressed even before member states consider a full embrace of the CCJ as a final appellate court. Over to you, Ms. Williams. I am not sure. I, I didn't hear anything that you said. You're sounding very far away. Malaika, can you please type in the away. comment bar? Malaika will type the question in the interim. Can I invite another question or comment while we do so? And in fact, Ms. James ended her commentary by suggesting that a decision of such magnitude should not proceed within the hallowed walls of Parliament without a referendum. I trust that reflected your concern adequately. Do we have any other comments, questions? I'm just, I just heard hallowed walls of parliament. I'll come back to you, Ms. Williams. Let me entertain another question or comment from... Did I see the microphone going to you? Proceed, sir. I have to sit down with regard to my injury. That I'm is trying fine. To bring it to yeah. Hold, Hold still, still, Ms. Williams. Williams. Oh, my goodness. There is something, there is something, I'm, something I'm, 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 I must say thank you very oh, much wow. for tonight, madam. Um, you know, as as being part of, as being part of of the Antiguan, you know, both right, you know, and Vincentian, and both grandmothers and grandfathers, I'm delighted to to hear you speak on on the CCJ. Oh, she's not hearing. Oh, no, I can hear you very clearly now. Now I was saying that. It is, it, I was saying that it's so delightful that I'm part Antiguan and part St. Lucian on, on my mother's side and part Vincentian on my father's side, you know, it you might so. Be, it might be better if questions go to the where you are, I think it's Oh. Can you walk so, up is that Dominic? Yes, yes you can Dominic, can you um, ask the question because you sound in very clear. But that person is too far from the mic. Okay, I, what, okay. what right. I wanted to, to say to you, that I find it very strange that I, was, I came across an article which I researched where a gentleman who is a speaker of the House of St. Lucia stated, uh, among other things, can I just quote it? Please, he said there are among there are among us um, us persons who consider the Privy Council a relic of our colonial past, and he said he suggests those of us who wish for the, its retention as our final court of appeal are old-fashioned, out of sync, unpatriotic. Nothing could be farther from the truth. I stand proud as a defender of the British institution. And that roused me for a minute. And then he went on to say, the notion of Caribbean Court of Justice as a replacement for the Privy Council is being sold on the altar of national pride. Okay? After all, which Caribbean citizen would not feel honored to have his or her brother sitting on the region's highest court? But that's all, that's all, all good. But then he goes further down and states had, had all the individual islands remained free of political taint 
patriot patriotism might be insufficient reason to bring the Caribbean Court of Justice to fruition. And uh, without the smallest hesitation, the court would receive my vote. So you hear what he's saying? That he is, he is very pro Privy Council. Without a doubt, nothing exceeds that. And he even goes further and he, he gives you like, you, like you explain situations and examples in Antigua. And he gives an example right here in St. Lucia. He says, uh, there are too many instances where the judicial process did not get underway for fear of political repercussions. I well, I well remember when Mikey Pilgrim was charged with sedition. He, he was then an op opposition MP. By the time the case against him was ready to go before the court, Pilgrim had controversially been made interim prime minister without any explanation as to why the charges were dropped. So, so of course, St. Louis had, it, had, had a part in a lot of misdeeds, maldeeds, as regards to the court. But, but then he goes on to say that what assurances do ordinary citizens have that, you remember, you remember Errol Barrow from Trinidad, from Barbados, sorry. He was prime minister for a, number, a great number of years, great prime minister. And he says that to what extent will each charity have to say in court appointments? Will whatever mechanism finally agreed upon be such that the smaller territories wouldn't, wouldn't be at the mercies of the larger? And then he, he talks about Caribbean governments must not be allowed to dazzle and impress us with their convenient notions of nationalism. We must ensure our human rights will not become compromised on the altar of political ambitions. And he made a quotation by Errol Barrow that, that in the islands, they, re, they are re, regarded in the courts as political bandits. That is a very serious quote to, map, to, you know, to, reminisce, to reminisce as the years go by if you research and, and want to subject the CCJ to the inequalities and malice or integrity whatsoever. But... Sir, may I encourage you to wrap up, please? Yeah, but okay. Okay. What, I'm, what I am really asking you, most of... There was another in, um, instance where a well-awarded um, journalist called, called uh, the courts of the, um, the high court. He said that we are the sheep and they eat grass. Pertaining to a case where uh, a former minister took the case to, to um, the high court and lost for the boundaries. You know, there's the boundaries where we have 17 and they wanted to go 21. And that particular minister won in the Privy Council and he spoke about why is it there is a minister on the high court who was involved as a constitu constituency member of a said constitu constituency um, area. So what he's saying that the integrity of the court is lost because, of, because that high court judge should not be practicing on that court. And you related that by all your examples, you know, as I heard you talk, you know, and that's exactly what I'm saying. What I'm saying to you now, why so many barristers, even though some of them were um, graduated from UWI and some of them, you know, from, from England, why are they early on in the years regarded the Privy Council as the number one? 
and suddenly they have changed their minds. It, it, it is astonishing. Just exactly what I was reading about this speaker. You know, why you think that well-versed lawyers, you know, ones especially with the QCs, which is KCs now, have done and gone that far in St. Lucia by not, by not um, defending the Privy Council. Thank you, sir. Thank you very kindly. Over to you, Miss Emmanuel, Miss Williams. I, sorry, I, I don't know why, um, but I don't know that it's just um, the older lawyers. There are quite a lot of young lawyers who are supportive of the CCJ as well. In fact, my niece is a lawyer and she was on the opposite side. She was in the audience and saying, Auntie Pearl, why, why, are, you, why are you doing this against us? So a lot of young lawyers are actually um, supportive. I know there are older lawyers who are not supportive. In fact, there's one KC, well, it's QC first, but now it's KC, who told me on referendum day, he came in. From, he was off island. He came in and he went straight to the, boat, the booth, voting booth, to vote no. Because he had seen the manipulation of the courts, of judgments, of, of whatever the case is. And this is a case, he saying that. So I don't know that they have, I guess people's experiences, lawyers' experiences, because there were some lawyers in Antigua, old and young, who were not supportive. So I, I just believe it's their experience and that is what shape how they look at it. And some of them feel too that because they're part of the legal fraternity, they somehow have to support the CCJ. Now, it's not that I don't support the CCJ. I'm just saying deal with the lower courts first. Deal with the issues at the lower courts. Deal with our perception of... of of corruption at the lower courts what is so difficult in that I, there seems to be an awful amount of resistance and reluctance to deal with these things and that is what um, persons are expecting to see now if we were seeing disciplinary action taken against judges and magistrates and lawyers being this bad left right and center you know the, the breaches of, of any code of, of conduct or, or, or of the law you get the book thrown at you people would be more inclined to say okay because we know that people will do things that are contrary to the law but we don't see it at least we don't see it here in Antigua so I believe it's just the experiences that would shape whether or not they support the courts or, or, or not and a lot of them have the, um, you know, the UV fraternity, they, they, you know, it's their friends, they, they all went to school together and that sort of thing. So I suppose, and I believe they have confidence, they have confidence that all oh, judges can do just as good, and I do too. I believe that they know the law and they can, they're just as competent, but all I'm saying, deal with the situation at the law courts first. Don't tell me to let deal deal with the top and leave the bottom nobody builds a house from the top down so that's my um, response to that thank you miss williams we ha thank you very much okay good evening the name is felix de Turville. uh mrs williams with all the issues that we have faced with in st lucia negatively I just have a quick question. Okay, that person is very far away. I'm not hearing Worry anything. Worry not yourself. We shall repeat the question 
So worry not yourself, Miss Williams. Dominic will relate to you. Thank you. Mrs. Williams, good evening. Good evening. We have faced in St. Lucia negatively. Why do you believe the St. Lucian government is of that haste to get to the CCJ? That's my question. From your experience. I should, I should ask you. I should ask you. I have no idea of the, the St. Lucia. Um, I know in Antigua, I, I believe it was just, um, you know, a feather in his cap. I think the Prime Minister wanted, he had just had an election and the opposition was was thoroughly trounced at the polls and he felt that he had the backing of the majority of the people because you see once you start going down a, a, a partisan way you're not going to get the buying of the people because people will become <laughs> very, very because of politicians because of lawyers so you need to have a non-partisan approach to it i don't know why um what would would i guess saint lucia has a two-thirds majority in parliament and they feel that this could be a, a, a feather in their cap a notch on their belt in terms of accomplishment being able to say that they they were the ones that made that step i don't i don't know Thank you, Ms. Williams. We have a question from Mr. Prudence. Thank you, Mrs. Williams, for a wonderful, enlightening, very enlightening um, presentation here this evening. You know, my, I love everything you've said here, and I'm with you in terms of your thought process about the CCJ. Many people believe that just because you choose to oppose uh, the CCJ implementation right now, it means that you're not patriotic. You don't want us yes. to complete yes. our independence. We had, we had all those names thrown at us. That's oh, right. We were called everything in this. the book. I was called the most horrible things and it didn't faze me. All I was saying to them, let's do this thing right. D this is let's right. do it right. I am no less patriotic than anybody else who supported the, the, the referendum at the time. Yes. My greatest fear is in the event of a contested elections, when you have, for example, in St. Lucia, a United Workers' Party in opposition, a St. Lucia Labour Party government, friends with most of these people in the judiciary system, mm -hmm not only here in St. Lucia, but regionally. And how would you, for example, you have Mario Michel, for example, someone who has been a candidate for the United for the St. Lucia Labour Party, was Deputy Prime Minister. You know, he's on the CCJ. I cannot, I cannot fathom in any way that Mario Michel, if he doesn't recuse himself, would ever vote to allow United Workers Party to even win in the contested elections. You know, and, and it's a fact. So we have to start thinking of those things. And we have to start thinking of the wider repercussions of the immaturity of our system right here. Because you have a lot of political interference going on right now in our judicial system. Of course. And, of course. Yes. Of course. All over. And All over. In that, Antigua too. That's right. And, and these are just some of my, my fears. It's not really a question per se, but I am just saying to you that I am very pleased that you're enlightening us on this particular subject. And I am very pleased that you're drawing a line. And you've drawn a line because you won your line. So all we're asking this government in St. Lucia is to give us the opportunity to vote free and fair in a referendum. That's all we're asking for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prudence. And Prudent. I think that's an unreasonable request. I don't think it's an unreasonable. I think it's the moral thing to do. I really do think so. May I I'm invite happy that we, our constitution required a referendum. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. Jordan. Good evening, everybody. Miss Williams, I'm enjoying your conversation because I believe most of the individuals here this evening are against the CCJ no, and its present form. Away. 
Yes, at this present form, we are not for it at this time. My question to you, uh, from a person here, she says, uh, um, how do you go about explaining to the layman the present situation with the CCJ? Again, how do you go about explaining the CCJ to the layman in terms of educating them about the pros and cons of this present CCJ, whatever it is right now? I, I honestly think that it needs to be uh, the education of the people about the CCJ needs to be a non-partisan approach. You cannot have politicians, you cannot have um, people who are known partisan hacks operatives to be pushing any side, one side or another, because you will not get the buy-in of the people have ordinary people. I think one of the things that why people saw what I was saying is because I was not involved in politics at the time. I was just a banker. I just had very strong views about it and I felt that I needed to be a voice out there. I didn't care whether people, I didn't know that all those people were thinking the same way that I was thinking, but they didn't have the means or they didn't have that the guts to go and speak it. And so I, I felt that if you just have somebody, and because I had credibility in terms of people saying, look, she's not, um, she's not a politician, she's not a, a, a lawyer, she's not the, nobody for the legal fraternity, she's just coming and speaking from her heart. And people saw that. If you get ordinary people to go and speak to the people, they will understand. That's my feeling. I went out there and I spoke to the people. So what needs to happen is you can't have the francis alexis and the dennis byrons going to speak to the ordinary people they will never understand them because a lot of times they have a tendency to talk down to people because they have a different view because i remember at one point during the, the one up i had to say to them i don't appreciate you y'all trying to to speak down to me and the arrogance with which they speak in and trying to denigrate me because of my views it just doesn't work so they need to get ordinary people who understand the ccj how it operates how it it can be helpful to them give them cases let them go into the byways and the highways and talk to the ordinary folks about the ccj what it is how it can be good, how it can be beneficial to us, why you think we need to. And the same thing, if you have somebody who has the other side of the, the, the coin, you also need to allow them to have their say too. So you present both sides of the argument. I don't believe in just pushing one side. Let the people, it's a battle of, of, of persuasion. Who is able to persuade the people? So go out and let them make their case and the other side make their case and let the people decide thank you mrs williams do we have any other comments we have another minute for a comment or question before i wrap up if I'm there sure. are no comments or questions may i use this opportunity to encourage those of you um, who were very 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 distant that's okay miss williams i'm simply advising the audience viewers and listeners that those who had not attended last week's session that they may tune into youtube go to gdtv and there you will see the recording from last week's session which to my mind provided a very good foundation for much of the discussion that we are having this evening. So in the event you wish to connect the dots, please do spend some time perusing that video so that you can get a more complete picture of the discussion that we are having this evening. Terry, may I kindly invite you up front. There are some blessings coming through, but do not shy away from the blessings of the Most High. If you could join me to the left, then you may pose your question. Can you um, repeat what she said, Dominic? Because I 
No, she was just going through some housekeeping matters um, for the benefit of the audience. But uh, we have Mr. Okay. Terry Valse, um, who has a, a question for you. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If the CCJ is supposed to be our replacement court from the Privy Council, why something of such magnitude wasn't discussed by CARICOM by CARICOM so that the islands and then extend it to the general population why something of that magnitude wasn't what by CARICOM discussed by the heads of government CARICOM even if we are individual in the individual islands but if we want to make the CCJ our final court of appeal Therefore, to me, something like that should have come out of CARICOM and the OECS to be um, discussed more extensively rather than just every island taking a decision on their own. Before you well, come I, in... You know, the heads of government, they would have already um, formed the CCJ. They're the ones, um, I think, they have say over who the president is each um, heads of government for the participating countries so um i don't know that perhaps that is something that they could do they could think about doing make caricom do the education of the, the the people in the island um let them be the ones to come out and you know carry that fight carry that argument bring the argument to the people and persuade the people to see it their way. I, I think that is a good idea. But I think the, one of the reasons that CARICOM will not do it because I guess maybe they do not have faith in their own people because they realize they, the, the level of corruption among the small islands, I guess that's why probably they did not make it one of the main agenda for discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Mrs. Williams. Colleagues. I'm not going to speculate. I'm not going to speculate on that. <laughs> we do have another question for consideration, but I'm duty bound to provide some clarification on Terry's question and the comment that followed to indicate that the CCJ is a creature of CARICOM and therefore heads of government would have in effect signed on to it and are actively making financial contributions to the functioning of the CCJ. However, I suspect your greater concern is why is it that conversation that would have taken place at the heads of government level has not been translated into a lexicon that you and I can understand, that average Jane and Joe can understand. And I think therefore we need to make that clarification. And this is what we are doing here this evening. This is what that we're endeavoring to do, that to take that very technical subject matter and translate it into a language that our citizens whose lives ultimately will be affected by this understand what the core issues are i also yeah, i'm not hearing a thing so that's you're gonna okay to mrs williams we'll come today. back to you i'm also duty bound to guard us from conflating the issues uh, it is tempting for us to throw all the issues into one bucket I am duty bound to guard us from doing so. We are concerned, we'll and rightfully you know. so, about the backlog of cases, etc. But that is very separate from the extent to which we are ready to embrace the CCJ and whether the people should have a say via a referendum. Do we have any comments or questions at this point? Madam Dominic moderator. will read a question from a listener uh, to Mrs. I, Williams. I don't know what's going on with this so, signal. So ma <laughs> Madam moderator, I do have a question for Mr. Tibbles. Um, he, it goes to Mrs. Williams. He said, um, in your presentation, you said that the government has gone to the Privy Council 16 times and only won five times. Why is it that you 
uh, feared if it went to the CCJ, it would have been uh, different? Or why is it you suggested that if the cases went to the CCJ, that the outcomes of those cases might have been a higher so proportion I, to the government? <laughs> I remember saying distinctly in my presentation that it was just all speculating, thinking aloud. I, I, I didn't say, I, I was just saying. I don't know, I was speculating. I just felt that um, perhaps they thought so, but it may not have been so. Maybe that was what they were thinking. Because I remember saying, maybe they think that if they have the CCJ, that the outcome would be different. But I said it was all speculation. So, I don't know, maybe they think it is friend, you know, friend and public. Because I remember at one point, the Prime Minister said, um, oh, he just called, he just called somebody, one of the justices. And I'm like, what? This was after the, the debate. Oh, I just call him and tell him, oh. And I'm saying, what? This is the kind of political interference. And then he he um, he um he pulled back and he said, oh, he was going to sue me. And, <laughs> and I, I know that um, he knows he said it because it was there on his radio station for all to hear what he said, that he just called one of the judges and... I'm saying no. So these are some of the things that make people believe the closeness between the political directorate and the judges on the CCJ is what people are afraid of. Thank you very much. Thank you, Miss Quinn. Uh, Mr. Fede, may I invite you to deliver the vote of thanks? And before you so do, can I encourage? those of you who are who are here in person to please complete the evaluation forms that you've been handed and to ask that you stay tuned for future public lectures of this nature because as terry indicated that there are decisions being made at the highest political levels that citizens ought to be okra with and be conversant on and it is lectures such as this one that endeavors to equip citizens with the information so that they can arrive at a learned educated conclusion and perspective for themselves may i therefore at this juncture invite Mr. Dominic Fede to deliver the vote of thanks. Dominic. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator. Um, just for your benefit, uh, Mrs. Williams, I have been invited now to um, deliver the vote of thanks. And that is uh, because we have no further questions or comments. Uh, very high Thank on the list in the list of individuals that we would like to thank is none other than you for joining us uh, via Zoom. The room is erupting with applause for you right now because all of St. Lucia here in the Annex, we appreciate your eloquence, your passion, your power, and most of all, your courage for standing so strongly on the point of the CCG and for the positions that you have taken and the success that you have had in your own country, Antigua, in helping to defeat a referendum there. So thank you very, very much for taking the time out uh, to join us here. I want to also express a big thank you to the Education Committee of the United Workers' Party. I am so proud to be a member of this party tonight because, guess what? We are in opposition and we are the ones leading the discussion on this important constitutional reform matter. I think that is a matter that deserves a round of applause for the organizers, for Chairman Daniel, for the deputy political leader and our political leader who is unable to be here with us this evening. I want to say a big thank you and it is with immense pride that I stand here today knowing that as a political organization, 
that we are taking the lead in taking this important matter to the public for discussion as they seek to make up their own minds on this decision. Um, I want to thank you, the audience, for braving the rain tonight and coming out in your large numbers. Thank you so very much. I want to thank the, the chairperson of Central Castries Branch, Ms. Malaika Compton. And I want to thank the executive of the Central Castries uh, constituency branch that have done an excellent job here tonight. Miss Pearl Williams, I'm so sorry that you're not here to partake in the wonderful refreshments that my eyes have just gazed on. Um, but <laughs> oh, I, I can tell you it looks very Maybe delicious possibly. from our end and we're going to do it in true St. Lucian style on your behalf. Thank you all for Thank you. another successful um, night. We are taking this event to the south of the island. We have events in the town of Soufre, in the town of Viewfort, and we are taking this discussion on the road to our people so that they can be informed about what is taking place. I thank you all very, very much. Thank you for joining us. Oh, we need to thank GDTV for doing such a stellar job in bringing this, bringing this, bringing the, the visions to our viewers. But then we have the best sound engineer in St. Lucia who has come out here tonight. Mr. Rusty Sounds is here tonight. And we want to thank him for his sponsorship, his support. We want to thank the Anglican Church for allowing us to use this beautiful, historic facility. And I want to thank you all. The list goes on. Thank you all for whatever thank role you. you have played in making this the tremendous success that it is. I have forgotten. Last but not least, I want to thank our moderator. And don't be mistaken, even though she's wearing blue tonight, she is very much a yellow lady. So I wanna, I wanna thank our moderator. <laughs> I wanna thank our moderator for doing such an exceptional job in bringing the level of intellect, decorum, and stateswomanship that she has brought to this event tonight. I thank you, Dr. Rigobot, for your participation. Thank you all very, very much. Put your hands together for yourself and for the United Workers Party and for our friend from Antigua, Mrs. Pearl Quinn yeah. Williams. Come on, let's raise the roof for her again, Thank everybody. You. I raise my glass. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We Take cannot care. thank you enough. Thank you. Take care. Take care. Thank you.